we have, we have, we've made some mistakes as far as humanity goes and our ongoing interpretation of things and how we follow things. And of course we grow, but the conventional way to follow prophecy, the word of God, it's falling apart. What is left standing is a pureness of God's word, untainted unambiguous there is no uh, you know no puzzling thoughts about it once you let go of man's precepts and of course in the word of God it says the word of God must be understood spiritually right it must be discerned which is to be understood spiritually since that is the case I'm telling you the Lord can open your eyes to anything he so pleases based upon his will for your life. But I give you one small piece of advice. In your pursuance of the Lord's clarity and truth, make sure nothing is in vain. Make sure all things are sincere. In other words, useful, needful, right? Our Father's way is that he does nothing for nothing. He's not going to do something just to do it, and there'll be no cause, no purpose behind it. That's, we do things like that, not the Father. All of his doings are without vanity. He stands against vanity. Right? So he would not practice what he teaches us not to have those things he teaches us not to waddle in, so to speak, right? My small piece of advice, so that the Lord may open up your understanding for your preparedness. Again, we see echoes of a communication from our Father globally about our preparedness, how we're not prepared, and how that, well, by no small part, we are blinded by quite a few things. And we need not walk around with the blindness. Afghanistan, although it is a divisive conversation, is a good example of our blindness. In two ways. Number one, life and death is in the hands of our Father. Yet, we still have an issue with what he deems he will do on the earth. We still have an issue with the way he operates. We still take issue and mount no defense against the wiles of the enemy when he does what he does like that, because I believe this, although I do believe all things are in the Father's hands, I sternly believe you can make a difference. Not you, the individual, for everybody, but you collectively can make a difference for all people. You can. For whatever land you live in, just like a Christian can make a difference in their neighborhood. Just like a church can make a difference in their city or county. Just like a group of churches can make a difference for that state. It's the same Sodom and Gomorrah situation. For the sake of 50, the Lord would spare a city. For the sake of 10, he would spare a city. That is to say, for the sakes of you, he would spare everything. But if we're not aligned and desiring to walk in his will, but we continue to pursue things of our own creation, why would he spare a city? That's simply going to entangle us in it. And we so willingly oblige. So we have to wake up to these causes, these things, and literally draw a line and say no more. No more. That is to say, to surrender and say, Father, I choose your way. But that must come from the heart. To choose the Father's way must come from the heart. 
Once it does come from the heart, you'll notice an immediate reaction of the Father regarding your situation and those things around you. Once it's from the heart, highly purposed. For example, how many of you desire to walk in the will of God? Or do you desire to walk in your preconceived notion of the will of God? See, I never know the will of God until at such time he discloses it. So I have to walk in obedience of the scriptures as best I can. In the way he established, not in the way man established. I don't want my way to be upon the earth, which is probably why I enter into no judgment in conversation, because I don't want my way established. My way is a way of a man which is highly destructive, but the Lord's way is pure. It accomplishes. It's exactly what I need in my life. And because I want that, in a lot of cases, silently, the Lord will allow me to see his will made manifest. It's an awesome sight every single time. And it gives me great comfort uh, to know that the Father will always carry through. That's why I, I, I don't face any discouragement. None whatsoever. Not regarding his word. I'm always discouraged in my own path. But see, more and more, I relinquish all those things I wanted, pursued. And there comes a time when you earnestly look for the will of God in all things. You know that statement when someone says God will, God's will be done? When people are healthy, they say, oh, yes. If someone is sick, they rebuke you. Why is that? It's because when a person is about to lose something of value, they don't want to hear anything from anybody except you're not going to lose it. See, I've learned not to ever do that. Because I have faith in the word, which means we lose nothing here on earth, including people. And the Lord has been quite merciful for that cause. Because we don't quite understand that yet. We don't entertain the conversation of death until a funeral. It's almost wiped out of our minds, and every single time a death occurs, we're caught off guard. That's not good because of this. As prophecy unfolds and death occurs, it's going to catch us off guard because we continue to refuse to accept the wholeness of his word and walk in the sobriety of knowing that the Father is right. Somehow, this must change. With encouragement by way of scripture, it can change. There, are, there will be reminders here and there. But it's, the, it's a decision we all have to make. All of us have to make that individually. Right? And that goes for everyone. Even me. When you do walk in those sober ways... You'll find a richness and a completeness in your life. But most importantly, the Lord, you'll find, has given you reasons. Wouldn't that be awesome if the Lord gave you a reason for this or reason for that? He'll do it. He'll do it. You know why he'll do it? Because he desires you to prosper as your soul prospers. He desires you to be complete. He doesn't want us walking around puzzled in a weakness or tainted in any way. But he is perfecting us. He is. And Lord knows we've got a ways to go. A surrender is to accept that change. To realize there are some things we have to work on. To comprehend it. To understand it. And to do something about it. And the Lord gave us that gift at birth. We are adaptable. We learn. One of the biggest things most of the body of Christ is learning right now 
is not to operate by men's precepts because before your eyes, you're seeing what men can establish never results in holiness. That's what you're saying. In fact, you've seen this over and over and over and over again. So what was the goal, though? Why would the Lord do this? He's doing it. He's allowing things to fail us externally of him so that we don't call upon those external things in an hour of great need that approaches swiftly. I'll say that again. An hour of great need is approaching. Many will have a need of comfort, a need of many things, and they will be serious. And the Lord does not want us calling upon some person in the world. He doesn't want you calling upon me or anybody else like me or any of the higher leadership in the world. But he wants you to call upon him as he intended. When you do call upon him, and when you have the self-discipline to wait upon him, then you see his deliverance. When you see his deliverance, then you have great confidence that he can deliver for both yourselves and everybody else. That's when the doctrine of Christ that you follow can never be changed. It's based on your confidence in his abilities. But what of a person who's never experienced his delivering abilities? Well, that person's not going to have a lot of confidence. Confidence builds as we go through this life and grow and are able to comprehend that, in fact, it is the Lord that delivered us. Because in the beginning, we thought that uh, circumstances aligned just right, and we just inched through, right? In some cases, we gave credit to mankind or credit to another person somehow. But the Lord wants us to see the truth. And the truth is, everything in our lives that came from man has failed us. And he does this for one reason, so that only his way established in your life will never fail. Our own resolve has failed. It tricked us. I remember the days when I thought I had some resolve, but it only lasted a short season. The Lord's resolve was permanent. This is what he wants us to know because the days, the days of true challenges lie ahead. We haven't seen them yet. It is my firm belief that we have not seen evil yet either. But we're about to. And if people are falling apart over men's decisions based upon arrogance, how in the world can we stand against true evil? See, we've been protected and shielded for a long time. But there was always coming a time when the saints of the living God would see. Let me ask you guys a question. Does the Lord desire us to have the truth? Yes or no? Yes or no? I want you to think about that too. Does the Lord desire us to have the truth? Yes or no? If one is to see the truth, if one is to operate in the truth, they must see two elements, darkness and light. To see only light is not seeing the whole truth, is it? Because to see only light means you won't recognize it. And here's how that works. If I were born in the light, how could anybody tell me that the light is good and I be passionate about it? I couldn't be. But if I were born in the darkness, and the darkness almost killed me every single day of my life, and all of a sudden I was delivered unto the light, then when somebody said the light is good, with great passion, I would say, yes, it is, because it saved me. 
You see how that works. You'll never know deliverance without bondage. You'll never know about the refinement process unless you realized that you were corroded and corrupted in the beginning. In other words, you have to see yourselves, not deny yourselves. To deny what you used to be, to say that you were never that thing, right? That's just simply not the way. You guys won't believe this, but the power system just turned on and it tried to turn the computers off. I had to hit the abort button. Are you kidding me? I guess it doesn't matter when you start a broadcast. Something goes haywire. But the computer situation is part of the conversation of the giant viruses in Jupiter. All of those go together. I think you'll find it very interesting when we have it. Now, of course, I'm going to have that broadcast when I am uh, a little more charged up and alert and aware. Because Satan will certainly try to interfere with that one. I need to be on my toes when we have that one. Now, because it's uh, very insightful. Anyway... A true challenge is coming for the world. You know, we were discussing Revelation 11 last night. You guys remember that? Uh, Revelation 11. We were also discussing the element of Jerusalem, right? Which takes or has an enormous amount of precepts because Jerusalem is not just the one thing we thought it was, but it's used in a variety of ways in the Bible, which are easily discerned once you begin to read you know, all the, once you become familiar with all the passages pertaining to it. But prophetically, we were talking about Israel and the two witnesses in Jerusalem who fell dead in the streets. And someone posed the question and said, basically, and I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but are the two witnesses um, the prophets of old, right? Are they, do they, you know, what's going on with these two witnesses? Who are they? Right? Do they have to be the prophets of old? And I made a comment that I don't believe in the two witnesses like everybody else probably would. I have a different insight on the two witnesses. And so a conversation began to unfold. Stand by, folks, if you would, bear with me. You know, it's okay when you have things like this happen because it helps you do something called load balancing, right? And uh, that's very good. Every problem that you have in life allows you to harden, well, let's say harden your facility. In other words, to make small adjustments and corrections so that you don't have that issue anymore. And that's precisely what's happening here. But we're having some very bad power fluctuations happening. Very bad ones. And who knows what that is. That'll take some further investigations, but it's a good thing. As I said before, some true situations and problems, well, they will soon arise. I'll give an example. Jupiter, earlier this year, they did some measurements of Jupiter, and of course, they suspect certain things about Jupiter, right? However, they found out that Jupiter is hundreds of times hotter than what it's supposed to be. Now, they've measured the temperature on Jupiter before. It's never been this hot. Something extraordinary is happening in our solar system, and we're somewhat shielded from it uh, to the Right now, we're shielded from it. Um, but that's not going to last long, right? So understanding prophecy with all these things that are coming, th there are going to be some very scary things that form that you'll see with your eyes. But it does not mean that will befall you. But here's my question to all of you. If it was your lot in life, to face something 
a very strange or heavy task in the world, are you ready to fulfill what you've been sent here to fulfill? Now, this takes a, a very different way of thinking. Because I want you to think about something. Number one, you didn't put yourself here. You didn't. The Lord made you, he purposed you to be here in this time. You could have been born in any era of mankind. In any situation, even now, you could have been a different nationality. You could have been one of those in Afghanistan, but you were not. You could have been one of those in Pakistan, but you're not. Right? You are who you are, and that's a highly purposed individual for a specific cause, a cause that your father knows. But are you in the frame of mind that you understand these things and do accept these things? He put you in the family you're in, whether you are have a natural family or if you're adopted. He did that. He's responsible for the environment that surrounded you from your youth, whether it be good or bad. He did all of that for his purpose. The question is, do you accept that? Do you accept that you exist for his purpose and his pleasure? In other words, for what he wants. See, sometimes we look at things of the Lord and we say to ourselves, well, maybe I might not like what the Lord has for me. That comes from a severe lack of a strong lack of understanding, right? That is yet to be, it, there are things yet to be discovered in your life. I'll give you this one thing. There's something in your heart that you yearn for. Every single last one of you, your soul cries out for. You cannot fulfill it. You can't do it yourself. No one else has been able to do it. So let me share this with you. Your predestined place in this earth is that fulfillment point. And only that place can satisfy your soul's cry. Now, your soul's cry can scarcely be interpreted by your mind. It's what you really desire by way of your spirit. And it's almost impossible to articulate. The Lord knows exactly what it is. In other words, the Lord knows how to fulfill you completely. Have you ever wondered, one time I wondered, I said, well, you know, the way I hear heaven described, I mean, I like that. Bunch of people standing around doing what? Because I was looking at my life and I said, well, you know, I don't like that kind of thing. That's just not me, right? That's not very fulfilling. Some people like to just hang around with animals, just to enjoy nature. Some people love to do things for other folks. All of us have different, these different fulfillment passions. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. I looked at people's description of heaven and I saw that bunch of people standing around doing what? What were they doing? I said, well, how's that fulfillment? Right? How, how was, because you have people that love to do something and people that love to see something and all these different types of people. And of course, that became a worry. I said, I said, Lord, I just turned to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm... This heaven thing, what is that? What is that? The Lord took me through some journeys, and I stopped living to go to heaven. I don't live to go to heaven. That's not what I'm alive for. See, I've entrusted all those details to the Father, all of them. What I do live for is today's fulfillment. Today's fulfillment to find here because the Lord told us, he gave us a sneak peek into heaven. And you know what he said? He gave us a sneak peek into our own lives of what we will be. You guys want to know what it says? It has not entered into the minds of men. That's what he said. 
We don't have the ability to imagine what it's going to be. We don't have the ability to imagine what we will be. He has not put that into the minds of men. So it's almost like an area off limits. It's like a language you can never learn. So at our hardest attempts, we still won't know because he already said so. And I left that area alone. And sure enough, the Lord showed me a, a, a dream, a dream that both encouraged me and broke my heart at the same time because he took me to a place I cannot describe. He took me through a set of events that were both difficult but very rewarding at the end. And the visuals were so incredibly stunning that even today I cannot recreate them. And no matter how long I attempt to oil paint, digital paint, sketch, or whatever the case is, I found nothing in, in earth nor in, in man's imaginative a scope to even match what I saw. Even the concept I've never heard spoken of, and I'll never mention it. It was well above what we're able to imagine. And when I saw that, it was encouraging. But immediately, I wanted to be there and not here. Right? But the Lord did that in a certain way, that everything on earth, now listen to this, based on that one dream, everything on earth, all sufferings, all everything is worth it. Just that one dream. That was just off of one scene. To make it to that one scene, everything in my life is worth it. Just to make it to that one scene. Now, to make it to the one place is not a place where I enjoy me. No, it's what I experienced. It's almost like a finalizing of something I saw that my soul yearns for in others. And I saw it. And it makes everything in life worth it. All the pain, all the sufferings, all the shortcomings, all the falls, right? Everything. Which is why I have no complaints in life, have you noticed? It's not because everything is going right. No. It's because everything I go through is worth it here. I don't publicly suffer, which means I don't advertise my sufferings. Because I'll get the... the uh, the Lord says when we do things like that before men, we get a reward from men. That's what he said. But if we were to go through something and never tell a soul, just continue to be who we are and encourage others, then we go through something in truth for the Lord who will uh, finish the cause in our lives, right? But I'll tell you, folks, if that was a sneak peek into something that will exist and I saw only a fractured fragment of it, then there's no way. There's no way you will not be completely overwhelmed in fulfillment in this time to come, which makes everything on this earth worth it. But we have an issue. We have a problem within ourselves. And I, I, I'm, I'm talking this way, folks, because we have to get prepared. Listen, I'm under, and it's true, I have a high fever tonight, right? Things have been going wrong all day. It seems like this day is one of those uh, toilet bowl days. Have you ever had one of those, right? But listen, right? I always seem to the, the, the find that piece of passion that I rise above my current state for the sakes of others because I know that this is nothing compared to what will face we have always had trials. Don't be afraid of that word, tribulation or trial. Your life is tribulation. Do you know that? A great trouble will not befall the saints, but you will see it. Your life is great trouble. That's tribulation. That's why the Lord said, blessed are those who cry now. Blessed are those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. He already gave us that blessings list. He said, woe to them that laugh now. Those having a good time, living it up, getting what they want. Their fulfillment is coming from earth, but we have been 
those who are like myself, those who really love the Lord, your life has been less than perfect, less than satisfying. It seems like every time you're about to make a stride forward, you take 20 steps backward. That's normal for a saint. But you prosper spiritually. The eternal part of you is being grown. And your flesh is being destroyed. Thank God for that. Because your flesh, by the way, is the one that interprets the world as this magical place. It draws you into lustful things and desires that are unpleasing to the Lord. When the flesh is broken, the confusion is gone. So never be afraid of the flesh being broken. But understand the Lord is growing your spirit. He's raising us. And when the Lord does it, when our Father does it, there'll be no mistaking the growth we have in us. That's a promise upon all of our lives that Satan can never touch. Satan can never touch it so long as all of us, so long as you continue to pursue Christ. So long as you believe, and even the belief you have in Christ, you didn't originate that. The Lord authored that in you. He put that belief in you to keep you, to secure you. It's enough of a belief to keep you searching. That's a great gift. The more you grow in Christ, the more you'll see how great that gift really is the more you'll comprehend how he kept you. And it wasn't by our doings, but it was solely by his. But what you agree to is everything. It is everything. Folks, I know you've seen some of the transitions in the world and overseas and this, that, and the other, right? But we've also talked about these things prophetically for years. Now that they're coming about, a lot of people are getting nervous. And certainly, people are losing their abilities to hide what they actually are on the inside. They're losing it. Well, that's about to increase a hundredfold. By the way governments are structured in the world, folks, that structure is going to change and change abruptly and fast. If your faith and confidence is in men by way of what they establish called government, you're going to be disappointed. You are the ones with the power of prayer. You are the ones that have the power to change the land. You know what the Lord said? If you, his people who are called by his name, would humble themselves, turn and seek his face, Acknowledge their own iniquities. Come full circle. Then he would hear from heaven. Then he would come and heal the land. Because of you. To heal the land means to set it right. Because of you. Not because of them. Because of you. For your sakes, things that have been stagnant. For your sakes, God delayed what he was going to do. But those delays are coming to an end. He gave us ample time. We've had a lifetime to get some things right. People are making their choices. Some will continue to struggle because they choose it. Some will give all to change and conform to obedience. That's when their eyes open. The obedient are always rewarded. And I tell you, prior to this time of the unfolding, it'd be a good thing for your eyes to be opened. They're about to release a whole new lot of this uh, UFO phenomena stuff and teach you about all the communication protocols. You're going to see the effectiveness of it. 
I assure you, it's going to draw plenty of people astray. Because they're going to say openly, oh, I'll never do that. And as soon as they're not around the saints, they will engage in that practice. Why? Because they still don't believe. Because they're still asking, oh, sh someone out there, answer me. I'll follow whatever answers. That's when people close to you are going to fall away. They're going to change. Listen, we're not here to change people. We're here as examples of the gospel. Please remember that. We're not here to cause people to think or accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to be an example of God's goodness, his grace, his mercy, his justice. The punishment that takes place in our lives is surely his justice. He still holds us up. He redeems us. But the world gets a good example of his justice they cannot deny. You're in fact the pages of God's word somebody is reading. You are. Now you can be used one of two ways because in the house of God are vessels of honor and dishonor. I for one do not desire to be a vessel of dishonor. They're all of God's house. In other words, they're all of God's creation. Not all are honorable. If you have a desire to be honorable, it's time to relinquish your pursuits. You already know which ones, because you know which ones fight against the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know which ones weaken your resolve in Christ and cause you not to trust. Now such things don't enter back into again. You see, a time is coming. Right? When you go back to the one spot, one time too many, and you'll never be seen again. It is a very real time when people are lost. And we need encouragement for one another. Do you have a victory? Yes, if you remain in Christ. That is to say, if you continue to follow him. But don't deceive yourselves like I did one time. Following Christ is not just reading about him. Following Christ is not talking about him. It's not just teaching about him. That's not what it is. Following Christ is when you hear him. You know what he kept saying? Those who have ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. He was talking to those who would hear and listen to him. Those who hear him seek to obey him. And within you is a born-again spirit. That born-again spirit desires to obey the Lord. There is also a component of flesh. Well, let's just say your first way in life. Which desires things of the world. This is part of your fight, part of the battle. Can you all see that battle? It's not easy, is it? Not easy to wake up every single day and choose to serve the Lord in earnest. Let's put it on the table. This is part of a very large and long battle. And that battle is about to intensify a thousandfold. And the elements that were unseen are going to be seen. Remember the Bible says, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That word mystery means hidden. The invisible things that you cannot attribute to iniquity, right? Those things that are actually the causes of iniquity cannot be seen. They're soon to be uncovered. Because the Bible says only he who letteth will now let until he be taken out of the way. He's going to be taken out of the way. And when he's taken out of the way, all the invisible causes of iniquity are going to be seen. All the vices are going to be seen. The, the trickster elements are going to be seen. The Lord warned us. He said, 
We do not war against the flesh, but of principalities and powers and, you know, those things. Spiritual wickedness in high places. So imagine a day when all that is seen. Are you ready for that? Imagine a day when those invisible things that cause people to sin are seen. Did you know when that day, that's when the man of perdition is revealed? Not before, only then. He is part of a hidden element in this world that causes you to target other people. Do you know what the Lord's been doing, it seems, for the last 10 years? It began with Obama. That was so incredibly clear. No, I'm not going to be political tonight because I'm, I'm, I'm no good at being political. President Obama was put in place spiritually because God selected Obama. According to the word of God, he appoints kings, does he not? A king is not necessarily who you think they are. That's a different subject. But the Lord appointed him. Why? Because you're involved. Satan did not appoint Obama. God did. God appointed Trump. Satan did not appoint Trump. God did. Satan did not appoint any of those folks that were in power. The Lord did, just like he said he did. In man's kingdoms, he appoints whom he will. He appoints those kings because of you. He did not change that. But he did say he would uncover it. Now, when that man of perdition is revealed, then the evil that works behind the scenes is going to be seen, and a king will rise over those elements over the spiritual elements that are unseen and the physical elements that are seen. That's what the Antichrist is. He encapsulates that authority over wickedness. He will command it, and you will see it. See, in those days, you'll no longer blame a person, but will see the true cause of the error. Until that time, we were told not to point or target people of flesh, but to understand that the battle is taking place with the unseen elements. And that requires your faith and your trust in the Lord's word to be victorious. Because if you don't do it that way, you're going to be victims of these hidden things. You know, there are people right now whose minds are fractured and they sit in confusion. They can be healed from that. But in order for that healing to take place, they must agree and accept the word of the Lord. The Lord will not heal a person who seeks brokenness. He will heal the person who seeks Christ, who seeks liberty of Christ, that freedom of Christ, who chooses the living God. Because when Jesus healed, he said, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Meaning, if the Lord were to heal many of us, would we go out and, and perjure ourselves again? For our end condition to be worse than the first. My fever left. Speaking of that, isn't that funny how that works? That's so funny. That is hilariously funny. Side note, I like it when the physical witnesses see that. It works that way every single time. If you persevere and you don't, you're not really worried about the fever or anything else, you just go with the Lord's word, strained or unstrained, to show the frailty of flesh is good. It's a good thing, right? But when you press through, the Lord, is he, he will equip you. Listen, he'll equip you to walk in his will. He will not equip you to walk with Satan. He will equip you to walk in his will. I've experienced that so much. It's so normal to me. 
I wouldn't even call that a miracle. I'll never, I'll never mistake. And I say, thank you, Lord, for the grace and mercy I see in it. But it's so common. A miracle is something above and beyond what we expect, and what we're used to. Something beyond the normal, supernatural, above the natural. But now certain things are so commonplace. Good Lord, I know. L listen, if, if the supernatural things can become normal to me, then I know they can become normal to you. Can I ask you guys a question? Who was greater? John the Baptist. Were the people John the Baptist baptized? Who was greater? Can anybody answer that? Who was greater? The Bible teaches us that the least is the greatest. The greatest is the least. John the Baptist was called into servitude to the great ones. The people he baptized were greater than he. You know what that means? If I can experience what I experience, then you'll have a thousandfold more than me. There is no way any of you can ever be below me. Or you would have my position and I would have your position. If you had children and the means to send them to the best schools in the world without all the grime of this world, you know what you would do, likely, because you love your children, you would send them to the best schools. And the best schools contain the most qualified people to teach your children. That's how you determine if they are the best schools or not. Not because a building is beautiful, but because the teachers are qualified to impart to your kids the best knowledge the most sound ways of doing things, and so on and so forth. When the great ones come, God calls teachers, people, the best to feed his children who are worth more than the teacher. Again, if I can experience these things, you can experience a lot more every day of your lives. So what's the element that stops it? What stops it? It's our persistent way of doing things. You ever hear somebody say, oh, well, I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. You ever hear that statement? There's no way any of us should ever have to make that statement. Well, I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. That's a personal decision. Holiness need not make a decree like that, but just simply does it in obedience and compliance with the Lord. And it makes a difference. But we make too many of our own declarations. I'm the guiltiest of all of that. And we persist in our own will. When the Father wants us to go one way, we've dug a trench. We've dug a, um, or started laying the groundwork to go a different way. And because we said it, we'll say, forget his way. I'm committed to this way. And then we start praying to call God to fix our way in the earth. And when it doesn't happen, we get upset. That's when a lot of people, I've heard too many people say, well, how can there be a God? Because he didn't do this for me. It's almost like people are praying, calling Jesus as a servant to themselves. And they have forgotten. He 
He's not the lamb anymore, but king of kings and lord of lords. He is the advocate with our father. He is the covering of our sin to the father. He is. And it's his gospel. Not ours. Less he be within us, then surely his gospel is going to be in your heart. And here, here's one point. Here it is. Do you agree with this gospel? Because if you do, you agree that all men, all men, so long as they have life, have a chance for salvation. And if we believe that, then we don't condemn but we do things a different way. The Father said, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with whatever measure you judge someone else, you're going to be judged. Right? We do it all the time. We pass a sentence called our opinion upon somebody's life. All the time, without knowing the uns, we see probably about 10% of a person, which is the outside. The 90% is what you cannot see. The thoughts, the heart of a person, that's 90%. That's what they never share. You don't see it, they don't speak about it. Something God knows and we don't. So what we've been doing is seeing the 10%, saying you're guilty based upon the 10%, not knowing the 90%. So in essence, we can't even see the person. But because of what we are offended by, we do pass a sentence on. And the Lord already told us, if we judge that way, we judge somebody that way, we're going to be judged that way. It comes into your situation. Your situation is going to be the product of what you assign to others. 